Some of you are basically confident that we can do something today, but praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can hold fast to your word. Thank you that we have a hope behind the veil that anchors us in times of storms and trials and tribulations. Our anchor holds behind the veil. We thank you for that finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We thank you that we can rest and have complete confidence in it in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I pray that you would speak to these, your people. Use me as an instrument. I've yielded and submitted myself to you, and I trust you. That you'll speak the words and word of God through my lips. I pray the hearts of the hearer would be open and ready to receive. And that we would receive instruction and understanding and righteous living. That we would receive and understand, Father, what it is that you've done for us, what it is you're trying to say to us. We'd mix it with faith and it would become profitable for us. This is what I pray today, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody who agrees with me say, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I, I'm glad to uh, be here today with you. I'm, I'm delighted that you've come to church. I didn't scare you off on Easter. Praise the Lord. Some people said, well, isn't Easter pagan? I, sure, whatever. Resurrection Sunday, Easter, the day Jesus beat had death, hell, in the grave. You can call it whatever you want to. Uh, it's not a religious thing. There's, there's no ordinances or rules surrounding it. I thank God that he's alive. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to First Peter, and we're going to get into some, some scripture here. Uh, if you if you want to know, I, I don't know that you'll even care, but today's just going to be a textual sermon. Um, I, I believe that the Lord has given me this text and that we're going to read it and we're going to expound on it, and I believe that we're going to be blessed by it. And should he sell, tell me to do something else, then we'll shift. But for now, this is what I have in my heart. Praise the Lord. Uh, those of you who are visiting with us, we want to say welcome to you. Thanks for coming. We know that there's lots of different places you could be on a Sunday, but you chose to be here or you were a drug here. So praise the Lord either way. We're glad that you're here. And uh, we say often that we are not a perfect church, but we're a good church. And we're glad that you're here, a part of it. You make it better. Amen. We're going to get into the Word of God here, and, and I believe that the Lord's going to help us. As I was thinking on this and praying... Uh, the Lord just put a couple of things in my spirit uh, regarding this particular passage of Scripture. And uh, I was thinking about how, what now? I mean, Jesus is raised from the dead. We've celebrated Resurrection Sunday. Now what? But you know, it's one of those things that if you look in the Scripture, you know the entire New Testament is about one single event. It's about the fact, not that he's going to die on the cross, but that he's going to raise from the dead. And everything that we believe hinges on that one event. It's one simple act of God that hinges all the other word and words of God. It's all the central, central theme and, and, and idea in belief. And so now we're beyond Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Now what? What do we do? And you know, the resurrection power of God is available to each and every one of us every single moment of every single day of our life. Amen. Thank God for it. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it to the superabundant. I have come that you might have life and have the, the same life of God, the Zoe of God, and have it abundantly. And so what now? What about the abundant life of God? And I'm not asking you to raise your hand, and I'm certainly not judging you. Jesus will do that. If you were here Easter Sunday, you know what we're talking about. But anyway, Jesus is the one who's been appointed by God to judge. I'm not judging, but my job is to get you to answer questions to yourself. Amen? I heard one old Baptist preacher one time say, the sermons ought to do four things. One, it ought to help you. Two, it ought to teach you. Three, it ought to challenge you. And four, it ought to tan your hide. <laughs> I thought, you don't tan my hide, buster. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think everybody needs to get spanked. I, some, I think sometimes we just need to be loved on by God. 
because God poured out his wrath on Jesus so he doesn't have to pour it out on you and me. Amen? So what now? What next? Resurrection power available to each and every one of us. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read this starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I have been begotten of God to a living hope because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Boy, I don't know about you, but that's good. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, which is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved or you suffer or you go through with distress various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy unexpressible in full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings that Christ, excuse me, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit and sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. I was reading this in a modern translation. I just want to pick a couple of verses with you. We'll go through this again. Just keep your eyes, as it were, on your text and listen to what a a, a new modern translation, as it were, says. Now, you might say, well, preacher, I think that, you know, the Apostle Paul preached from the King James Version. If you just stop your foolishness and think about how dumb that statement sounds, (laughs) you'd be helped. Because certainly Paul did not speak Elizabethan English or Elizabethan, depending on where you're from, Shakespeare. Amen? So it's okay if we speak it in a different translation. It doesn't take anything from it, as long as we keep the, the original thought <clears throat> and message that God is wanting to relay to us through the Word. So it says, What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have Him, this Father of our Master, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Ooh, I like that. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have been given a brand new life. Say brand new. You know, a lot of times people think that Jesus came so that way we would have an opportunity to behave differently. And so we've, we've boiled Christianity down to a process of rules, regulations, and, and certain uh, mannerisms of how we should behave and, and this social construct of this is acceptable and this is not. And we've boiled it down to simply behavioral modification. Well, God did not send Jesus to you to make you good because you were bad. According to the Word of God, God sent Jesus for you and for me to kill us. To kill us. What do you mean, kill me? Well, I'm glad you asked. We'll get to that in a moment. God sent Jesus to kill us and then to recreate us, refather us, and make us something entirely different than we were before we died. You have been, say have been, thinking about the tense is that past, present, or future. 
Let me rephrase that again. Sunday morning. Thinking of the tense of you have been is have been, past, present, or future. Some of you are still not sure. We'll move right along. Have been means already happened. You and I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. Paul says to the church in Rome, you were, you were dead in your sins and you died to sin again. You were born dead in the trespasses and born dead into sin. But now you have died to sin, so reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. You've been crucified with Christ. You, were, you, were, you died with Him. You were buried with Him. You've been raised with Him. And now you're seated with Him. Amen. I mean, that'll make anybody shout. Amen. Except for you guys today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have been given, have been given a brand new life. Wow. Different. New. Praise God. And I have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And that future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and over the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. The day's coming, folks, when we're going to have it all. We'll, we'll be out of this corruptible body. We'll be out of this mortal body, and we'll put on incorruptible and immortal bodies praise god i know how great this makes you feel even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime pure gold put in pure gold put in comes out proved gold genuine faith put through the same comes out proved to be genuine when jesus wraps this all up it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. I like that. That's pretty good. Praise the Lord. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him. With laughter and with singing, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, complete in total salvation. The prophets who told us this was coming asked a lot of questions about this gift of life God was preparing. The Messiah's spirit let them in on some of it, that the Messiah would experience suffering, followed by glory. They clamored to know who, who, and when. All they were told was that they were serving you, us, you who by orders from heaven have now heard for yourselves through the Holy Spirit the message of those prophets which has been fulfilled. Do you realize how fortunate you are? Angels would have given anything to be in on this. How fortunate are we? So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ brings us new life. As we talked about last weekend, it brings us everything. It's, the, it's, it's all of it. But how does that apply to you on a Monday? How does that apply to you on a Tuesday? How does that apply to you the other 51 Sundays of the year? What is it doing? What is the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ doing in you and through you and for you? It matters. It changed everything in humanity. Paul's talking to the churches in Philippi, and he says that I would know him... And one of the things that he says is in the power of his resurrection. That I would know him in the power of his resurrection. That no doesn't mean, well, I read a book and I have an understanding of it and I can communicate it to someone if they ask. That word no is the same word you'd see in relation. Adam knew Eve. That I would know experientially the power of Jesus' resurrection. Still today, there's Christians who say, you know, I get it. I know he raised from the dead, but I'm not quite sure why that matters to me Tuesday afternoon. Because we think, and we've been taught inaccurately, that that's just for a day in eternity. Someday we'll go to heaven, and then it'll all come together, and then it'll all matter. 
But no, it matters today. Because the same power as we prayed over this family, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling on the inside of you and I bodily. And it's there to do something, to quicken us, to strengthen us, to heal us, to lead and guide and govern us, to protect us, to prosper and bless us, to promote us. Praise God. Praise the Lord. This isn't even what I wanted to get into. I'm just having fun. Just enjoying myself. Man, I'm about to get on an airplane for the next 48 hours starting tomorrow, so I might stand up here for 10 hours today and just talk. Someone said, why you want to do that? Because I don't want to sit down, because my bottom is going to hurt really bad. Africa's not close. It's really not. <laughs> Moving right along. Verse 13. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in reverence knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Now, the, the New King James Version says, from your aimless conduct. From your aimless conduct. I want to read this again real quick. And if you, if you call on the Father, who without partiality, 17, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. You were redeemed from your aimless conduct. That aimless conduct was received by tradition from your ancestors, from your fathers. Aimless. Yesterday, I had the privilege to stand in front of, I don't know, 250 men from different churches in our state, other states, even outside of the country. And this scripture just came to me in 1 Peter. And so I was talking to them. And, and I know that this is none of the men who are here today because we're different than every other male on planet Earth. So this wouldn't apply to you, so just bear with me for a moment so I can tell you a story. Per adventure... If it does apply to you, maybe you could be helped by it. We're talking about the crisis that we have in the United States and in the world, really. There's a lack of men. The liberals who are wackadoos want to tell you that masculinity is toxic. Chauvinistic masculinity is toxic. But masculinity is certainly not toxic. No more than femininity would be toxic. God created them male and female. He created them. You know, often in, in a... <laughs> we're just going to touch this for a minute and then I'll leave you alone because I can already tell you're happy. <laughs> so what I was saying was yesterday, we have lived a life because it's been passed down by our fathers and their fathers that men run and hide and isolate themselves. Don't want to talk to other people. Don't want to get too close. Don't want to certainly talk about how I fear, feel because if I do that, then I'm a wuss. If I cry, I should be slapped and then killed, but certainly slapped before because I'm a man. But you know, the Bible has a totally different outlook on men. A totally different outlook on how men should relate to one another. A totally, totally different outlook about how we should worship God. And how tears are in the Bible. Men crying before the Lord. Crying out in jubilation and dancing and twirling like sissies. <laughs> Men coming to the altars of God and worshiping God. And a, a certain man in the book, his wife said, You're the king, bro. Get dressed. And he said, hide and watch, woman. I'll get more undignified than I am right now. 
That's just what he said in the book. But this toxic masculinity is a lie from the liberal left. And I'm not talking about Democrats. I'm talking about a devil. This isn't people. This is spiritual. Because we're tr there's an attack on men and women, born again or not, there's an attack on women trying to force them to be something that they are not and men trying to force them to be something that they are not. And that, that demonic ideology, it is not Republican. It is not Democrat. It is a spiritual problem. And that thing is trying to rip away at the purpose and the plan of God that men should nurture just like women should nurture. Bible. It's the Bible. But... I talked about, in this men's conference, this tradition, this stupid idea that you have to be so macho and tough. And then I mocked them because I'm fat, and I can. I said, some of you have biceps so big you can't fit in your tiny little t-shirt, but you're a child and you're afraid to talk to somebody because you're going to get hurt. Now again, I'm not talking to any men here because bless God, we got our acts together. We know what's up. Are you, are you here? Amen. But most of us, male types, have left it up to the woman to raise the kids and teach the kids to pray and teach the kids to read the Word. You should see the looks on some of your faces. You guys are super uncomfortable, and I like it. I'm just going to stay here for a while. We want the women to teach them how to pray. And my God, men don't sing out loud, so we're not going to teach our children how to worship at the altar of God, completely violating the Word of God. Totally, completely violating the Word of God. Women weren't supposed to go and teach the kids anything. Well, don't you think that that's crazy? Sure. That's crazy, because I think women can probably teach kids to do something. I think every child like me needed a mom like mine. Don't let your kids go climb off of the CN Tower. It's a bad idea. When I was a little kid, I was in Toronto. And they didn't have all the protection. That's, why, that's how you just you thin out the herd. <laughs> the stupid ones don't make it. And I'm climbing out all over the earth. Ask Mother Mom if you don't believe it. It happened. And they looked up and thought, well, that kid's going to die. <laughs> So I think we can learn things like, don't do that, you'll die. That's, that's helpful. But we're talking about this tradition that's been passed down from our forefathers and from our ancestors. Now, in the context, we're talking about salvation. But this is the point that I wanted to bring out to you today because it went over so well in the men's conference. I thought I could help you today. See, I'm going to guinea pig you guys, polish this up, so that way the next time I get to a men's conference where it would actually apply, I might be able to help somebody. Ladies, let me ask you a question. How many things are you, doing, are you doing in your life? I'm not even talking about spiritual things. I'm just talking about how many things are you doing in your life by way or by means of keeping a home, raising your kids. You're doing it because your mom did it. And she probably did it because her mom did it. And she did it because her mom did it. But when you look at it, it doesn't apply and it's stupid. And why do we do that? You ever seen something where you had a light bulb moment and an aha and you thought... I'm not sure why we've done that that way. We always say we always do this, but it doesn't even make sense that we always do this this way. Why don't we just do it a different way? It would be better if we did it this way. So yes, the ladies are saying amen. Four of you. Dad Hagen, Kenneth, Kenneth E. Hagen tells a story about a husband and wife. They're newly wed. And uh, they're getting ready to have their first holiday meal together. And so the, the newly wed wife takes out the whatever you call it, cooker, and takes the ham roaster. Thank you, Mother. <laughs> You'll bail me out. Takes out the roaster, takes the ham, cuts it in half, puts it in the roaster. And she goes about preparing the ham dinner, just like she'd always been taught by her mom. And so the husband challenges and says, why do you cut the ham in half? And she said, I don't know. That's how my mom did it. Goes to his mother-in-law, why do you cut the ham in half? I don't know. That's why my mom did it. has to do with the recipe. If you don't do it right, it won't taste the same. It'll be wrong. So they go about it, and they do the ham, just like mom did it and just like grandma did it. And so all of a sudden, they're sitting down, and they're cutting the ham, and they're sitting. 
And the husband says, I've got to have an answer to this because some men, probably not anybody in here, they just need to know, right? <laughs> he's been sitting on this question for about eight hours and now it's time to eat and he's got to know, why do you cut the ham in half? <laughs> so in the presence of this <clears throat> three generations of women in his life, he says, honey, why would you cut the ham in half? And she said, because my mom did it that way and it won't turn out the same way if I don't. It makes sense, okay. But you can't squiggle out of this because I got all three of you here. I'm going to get to the end and find out why. So he looks at the mother-in-law and says, Mom, why do you cut the ham in half? And she said, because my mom did it that way. And it won't be good and it won't taste the same. It's part of the recipe and it doesn't work if we don't do that. And he says, right down the line, Grandma, why do you cut the ham in half? And she said, because I had a small roaster and the whole ham wouldn't fit. <laughs> I went to church and a fat preacher was talking about food. I don't know what we were trying. What are we doing? So I thought this was church. I'm learning home economics. I'm better homes and gardens to you right now. But how many things are we doing in our life that has just been passed down? This applies to everybody. Men, same thing. You do things a certain way because your granddad told you or your dad did or your uncle. And you're going to teach your kids the same thing. How many things, now listen, here's where this is applies. You say, I don't understand the connection. I, I figured that we'd help you here in a moment. How many things in your life and mine are we doing because it's been passed down? I'm not even saying it's bad necessarily. But how many things are we doing and believing, passed down from family members, ancestors, that are still tied to in from the land of Egypt, our old life, where we were in bondage, where we were dead in our sin and slaves to Satan. See, this is where it comes in because certain mindsets and mentalities, certain belief systems and the way that we view things, we've carried over. I, I started my preaching time, I was 12 minutes. That's how long I preached. I was given 15, I gave three back. If you're short, you'll be heard from again. But now that I have you here, I've got that anointing where I'm going to stand up a lot, so I'm going to preach long. So I said, everybody in this room, if you're born again and you know it, and what I mean by that is that you have received with simple childlike faith the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and now you are saved. If you're here and that's you, raise your hand. So we'll do that here. If that's you, raise your hand. Who's born again? It looks like if I can see everybody in the room's born again. Praise God. That's sort of good. We'll touch that when I get back from Africa. And everybody would agree that there are things in our life that we left back in Egypt. Sometimes it was friends, belief systems, addictions, certain vocabulary. Yeah? Yeah? Certain, certain wardrobe items that you might not wear on this side of Canaan that you did out in Egypt. Relationships, activities, habits. Some people went out on a Friday night and got drunk and beat people up. And I'm just talking about Bonnie. And then there's people like Kent that... Everybody says I pick on Kent too much. So Bonnie, here we go. But that, thank God, Bonnie, <laughs> old Southpaw Sally, she left that life, being born again, when Les Kent makes her mad, she left that life being born again. She's come out of Egypt. She's come out of slavery. She's no longer that person. She's born again, not of things that will corrupt, but of incorruptible things. But I asked you a question because we talked about how many people are still in the body of Christ today. They say, I know about the resurrection of Jesus on Easter, but I don't know how that works in the middle of June. What does that do for me in July? How do I get any benefit from that in August and September and, and so on and so forth? I'm, I'm, still, I'm just waiting for eternity so that way I'll have something 
to benefit from his resurrection. And that's not your fault. That's the church's fault. Because many have not taught about the reality of the resurrected power of Jesus Christ living in your life. But if we want to hold on to the things that have been passed down, of course, sin and addiction, there's real, real, real science attached to people with addictive personality types. There's real science attached to there are certain things that run in family lines and the, the tendency to have an addiction is prone in some that is not in others. That's real. That's a real thing. It's no different than hair, no different than height, no different than your build, your type. No, no different. But you know, you've been refathered by God and brought out of that, and that's why I, I went and started in verse 3, even though I wanted to actually start reading and, and talk to you about verse 18, because I wanted you to see that there's a brand new life. There's a brand new life. And you and I are brand new people. We are not the same person coming out of the grave that we were going in. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and he talks about death and he talks about resurrection and he talks about you and I and he says that which was sown in weakness is brought forth in beauty. You can think about you know, the, the caterpillar being sown and nobody cares about a caterpillar except for the ones that bite you and kill you. You don't want that. Other than that, you leave them alone. They're creepy and weird and you don't get them and so whatever. But somehow, some crazy thing God did, just because he wanted to show us that he can do whatever he wants to, and it's, he's awesome, he put two glands on the inside of a caterpillar that can make silk. Now, if Jim had those two glands, he'd be rich. More rich than he is right now. He'd just spin out some silk and be like, here you go, Feedy, you're in a cocoon. There you go. <laughs> check, check me out. And he'd sell tickets for the show, and then he'd get other people in line. If you want to be spun into a cocoon, your kid's been bothering you, I'll give you a little, little break. I'll spin you into it. See what I'm saying? God didn't put that in humans. I don't know why he didn't. It'd be weird. But it's also weird because what happens is that caterpillar goes in, it literally puts out this stuff, and it's silk, and wraps itself in silk. And it's sewn in creepy, fuzzy, weird-eyed stuff. It's gross. But there's a change that's taking place inside that cocoon. And time passes, and it's brought forth in beauty. You look at a butterfly, and all it has wings that didn't before. Where'd they come from? Don't know. Something weird happened. But now you've got these colors and these wings, and it's not creepy and fuzzy. It's pretty, and you want to watch it float around all the time. And if you're stressed out, it's a cool thing to do on a cool day. Just watch a butterfly fl flit and flutter around. Something happened. Well, no different than you. You're different. You're, you're not the same thing that went into the grave. You were brought out of the grave, raised with Christ, and you're something brand new, different, new in kind, quality, in nature. And, and you're, you don't have wings, at least we don't think, but you're beautiful. You're recreated in the hand and the image of God, and you're touched, created by, to, excuse me, twice created by God, once in humanity, in your flesh, and then once in the Spirit. So everything that's back there in Egypt, everything that's back there in bondage, can be left back there in Egypt. And it takes the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in your life on a daily basis to keep those things out. My pastor says it this way. He said, my most challenging task as a pastor of almost 40 years is to keep you out of the world and the world out of you. My most challenging task being a pastor is to keep the world out of you and keep you out of the world. To not go back to those things. So we've been redeemed with, the, with uh, excuse me, we have not been redeemed with corruptible things like gold or silver from our aimless conduct. The same translation says this. It cost God plenty to get you out of that dead end, empty headed life you grew up in. It cost God plenty. 
it was a very, very great price that he paid. And he paid it for you and he paid it for me. So how do I live in resurrection power on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and in the summer and when it's not Easter, resurrection time? We remember the sacrifice of Jesus, yes. We honor the sacrifice of Jesus, yes. And we thank God for that, yes. But also we apply it. If I have been born again, if I have been raised, this again, why we went through and we read the scriptures. We were born again. We are not the same. We're not the people that we were before. So our relationship with God comes into play, and we can say, once we start to have a thought, once we start to have an appetite, once we start to have a draw back to something that you've been delivered from, you can simply say, no, I'm a different person. I've been raised from the dead, and that is part of the life that died. That's a part of the life that's back in Egypt, in bondage. I'm not in bondage anymore. Amen? I'm born again. I'm brand new. I don't have those, those same tendencies, don't have control over me. I now have control over them it may run in my family but i'm born again and brought into a different family and it may be a problem in my bloodline but i've been refathered by god and so i'm not the same person that i was going into the grave that i was coming out i'm not the same one sown in weakness i'm the one brought forth in beauty and glory the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ makes that, without a shadow of a doubt, available to you and I. If you're dealing with something in your life, an addiction, if you're dealing with something in your life, depression, discouragement, tendencies to lie, tendencies to cheat, tendencies to steal, you're born again. And you haven't been redeemed of things that will be corruptible or die or fade. You've been redeemed to cost God plenty to save you and get you out of that dead end, empty-headed life that you are in. Amen. Again, 17, and if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's word, conduct yourselves throughout your the time of your stay here in reverence, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God, since you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently, with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So I have called on God. I asked you if you were born again. You raised your hand. You've called on God. Now the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ has given us a new hope, a new life, an opportunity. If you, like I said, if you have a tendency in your flesh to be someone who's untruthful, you don't have to stay there. If you have a tendency in your flesh to be someone who takes things that don't belong to you, that's called stealing, and you don't have to do that. Amen? If you have a tendency to be someone who has a, a, a hot, short temper, some people don't have a fuse. There is no fuse. Other people have a short fuse. But you're not that person anymore. You're born again. People walk around and they say, well, I can't control it. It's just how I am. It's just what happens to me when I get angry. Well, I'm sorry. I thought that you were recreated. I thought you were new. Well, I don't like this preacher. I wish you'd talk about how everything is cool with me and God and I don't have anything to do. That's fine. We'll maybe get to that another time. But right now we're pushing buttons. Remember, I'm leaving soon. <laughs> and if, if, you, if you guys treat this message like most of the other ones, I'll be fine when I get back. You won't even remember this happened. That was not true-ish, sort of, kind of. 
What is it that you're dealing with? No one say it out loud. That would be weird. Maybe you have a problem looking at things you shouldn't look at. Maybe you have a problem touching things you shouldn't touch. Maybe you have a problem taking things you shouldn't take. Drinking things you shouldn't drink. Smoking things you shouldn't smoke. What, I don't know what it is. It's between you and the Lord. But I'm coming to give you encouragement today. And I'm coming to give you life today. And I'm coming to give you a hope today. And that is that if God raised Jesus from the dead, which we know that he did, and you called on him, which you testified that you have, then you now do have the power. You do now have the power. You didn't before, but you do now. Why? Because the resurrection power of Jesus is living on the inside of you. So it wasn't just one moment in human history where God rocked the entire universe, both naturally and spiritually. This applies today. When you're all alone and you got a thought or a fear or a tendency or an urge or a nudge or a want or a desire or a taste or a mmm... It applies today. I can say, no, I don't have to go off the handle and cuss somebody out. Bonnie, I hope you're listening here. <laughs> I don't have to fly off the handle because somebody parked in a parking spot that I wanted to park in. Oh, I know people do that all the time. I'm thinking, brat, you're a brat. You should spank yourself. <laughs> you're certainly too old for somebody else to spank you. Just spank yourself and stop being a brat. If you have a tendency to tell somebody something that isn't true. You know Christians are so weird. Which I am one. And I think that's good that preachers should be Christian. I think that's pretty solid. I mean, whoever thought that idea up was working on a, on a full, full head of intelligence there. But uh, Christians will go to a restaurant and something will be left off the bill that you asked for. Not Kent, but the Christian. Like, you know, a steak. I think I'll have a steak. Okay, how would you like that prepared? I'd like it prepared thus and such. And what would you like for sides? Well, I'd like this, that, and the other. And then at a table of ten people, one meal's left off of the bill. And a Christian will sit there and say, boy, I tithed in church and God is blessing me. You're stealing. Don't steal. That's stealing. Tell somebody. If you don't have character in a restaurant with someone who's working their tail off to put food on the table or whatever else they're working their tail off for, you don't have the integrity or the character to say, hey, uh, sir, excuse me, ma'am, you left my meal off the bill. I'm more than happy to pay for that, seeing how I ordered it. I was managing a restaurant one time, and a guy in our community who was known as a Christian businessman, I don't know how either of those things happened, but anyway, he was known as a Christian businessman, and I was the manager of this, this restaurant. And I took the man's order, personally. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper and handed it to the person who was waiting on the, the gentleman, and they put it in the computer. Well, I went into the kitchen with my handwritten note and I told the cook, this is what it is, this, 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 and this. Get it on, on the ticket, get it in the oven, let's go. They put it in. The waitress got the food, took it out to the table. She went and plugged it into the computer so that way the ticket would be generated and it would go on the books and we'd be able to cash it out and you get the whole point there. And we're getting ready to go out and, and the gentleman is getting ready to cash out and I'm there at the cash register how was everything and I looked through the ticket and there's a meal missing on the ticket and it was his there's four other people at the table and there's a meal missing on the ticket and I have a memory that's somewhat decent I said well sir your steak is missing off of this off of this slip he said no it is not I said, well, yes, it is, you dirtbag. I'm the one that took your order. What are you talking about? No, it is not. This, is a, this man has a reputation in the community to be a Christian business person. And he fought me at the cash register. 
verbally, I would have punched him in the throat and knocked him out, and then I would have repented and said, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> this, is the, this is the same blessed sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ that decided that no one deserves a tip ever, no matter what they do. His son, I like him a lot. I bless him, Lord, because he's retarded and needs help. So anyway, I'm fighting with this guy, arguing and trying my best not to call him all the things in my mind that I want to call him. And he said, and I quote, it's your fault it didn't get on the bill. I'm not paying for it. <laughs> I said, really? It's my fault it didn't get on the bill. You ate it and you're not going to pay for it. I said, yeah. And so I just share that with you to say, don't be that way. That's not God blessing you. That's a human who made a mistake. So I took money out of my pocket and I paid for it. And then I walked out into the parking lot with him. I took my shirt off. I wasn't walking around without a shirt on at all. I had an undershirt on, but I took my uniform off thinking, if I punch this guy on the eye socket, I don't want everyone driving by to know that that was the manager of the of the restaurant so i took unbuttoned my shirt and popped it off and walked outside and i walked out to his car and i was praying in the holy ghost that my left cross would still be just as good as it ever was and i said i have a i have a i have a complaint that i want to lodge against you and my bible tells me that i have the responsibility to do this because my Bible tells me that I'm spiritual based on my lifestyle. And so I am not rebuking you because you're older than I am, but if you see a brother in a fault, those who are spiritual, there's a qualifying statement there. That doesn't mean anybody who's born again. It means those who are spiritual. There are people in this room that are not spiritual. But there are some people in this room that are spiritual. If you see a brother in a fault, those of you who are spiritual, go to your brother in meekness, considering your own self, because you could also come into temptation. And so I went to him and I said, how about you never come back here again, ever, as long as you live? And he said, well, I don't think I'll do that. And I said, well, I think that you should. And he said, why? And I said, because you give people like me an incredibly bad name. And when they see you coming in the parking lot, every one of those people say, I'm not waiting on so-and-so because I know he's going to run me ragged. Waitresses and waiters are not slaves. You don't own them. You didn't even like lease them for 45 minutes. They, they don't work for you. They're there to help you. Moving right along. What is the point of this story? I'm getting to it again. So I said, people don't want to wait on you because you're a dirt bag. And then you leave a tract instead of a tip because you're a dirt bag. This is all opinion, by the way. And I said, it'd be better if you didn't come here. There's 1,700 restaurants in this county. Find one elsewhere. And he said, no, I think I'll come back. And so I said, well, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. If you come back, I'm going to hire somebody to cut your tires. <laughs> this is still going on Facebook. <laughs> and they said, you would not. And I said, watch me. And I said, he said, I'm going to call your boss. I said, punched out. I'm not even on the clock right now. I'm just telling you, if I see your vehicle here again, I'm going to hire somebody, a little punk kid. I'm going to give him a $100 bill so he'll do it. And he's going to cut three out of your four tires just because. <laughs> and he said, you really don't want me here. And I said, you're starting to get the picture. So he said, well, I don't understand. This is the whole point of the story. I don't understand. I can't help it. I've always been this way. Now, I did this on purpose. You'd be shocked by this, but this was totally intentional to tell you this whole entire story to make you mad at that guy. Everyone in this room wants to know who he is, right? Yes or no? 
you want to know who he is in case you find him at a restaurant, and you're going to be the little kid that's going to cut his tires. You're like, that guy's a jerk, right? Yes or no? So none of you are upset at this guy? You think this is grade A quality human being? So some of you are upset with this guy. How many times do you do the exact same thing? It's just different. How many times do you do something that's so stupid and so destructive and so harmful? I told the whole story on purpose just so I could hit you with that. Wham! How many times do we do the same thing? Well, I, I can't help it. I've always been this way. Well, I've got an idea. Lightning flash, change. What? I'm not positive I get the message, Pastor Brian. The resurrected power of Jesus Christ is available to you to help you not be a jerk. To help me not be a jerk. To not hide under the excuse of, I've always been this way, but to apply that to my life on a Thursday evening when the wait staff made a mistake. And I know it. And I'm not sitting there going, oh, I hope they don't catch it. I'm man enough or woman enough to say, you missed this, honey. You're so busy, you can't see straight. And you made a mistake. And you shouldn't get in trouble for it. I ordered that chicken or steak or burger or hot dog or pop, soda, whatever. And you didn't put it on the bill, and you need to put it on the bill. Well, what if my parents were cheapskates? Then, then your parents were cheapskates. But that doesn't mean you have to be. Well, what if I was raised that way? Doesn't matter. You were raised that way. Neat. That's cool. But you're changed. You've called on God. You've been redeemed. That, you know what the word redeemed means, by the way? It means bought by someone else for ownership. If I give you this and it's a coupon, you say, Jim, this is good for one Coke. Bring it in to me anytime you want to. Give that to me. I will redeem it. I'll now own that, and I'll give you the Coke. God redeemed us. And it cost God a lot to get us out of the dead end, empty-headed life we were raised in. So the resurrected power of Jesus on a Thursday evening or a Wednesday morning or a Monday or a whatever day of the week is working in you to change you because the one who went in was raised to be a dirtbag, was raised to be a cheapskate was raised to be an addict, or raised to be a liar, or raised to be a thief, or raised to be uh, this, that, or the other. But the one that came out was raised and refathered by someone completely different than who raised me, which was God himself. And his nature is now in me, and if I will just get out of the way and let him live his life through me, then I am without excuse. Well, preacher, that's easy for you. No, it is not easy for me. It's just as difficult for me as it is for you. It comes down to the power of choice. It comes down to the power of, I really believe that that resurrection power of Jesus is working in me to change me. And it's more than just when I get to eternity. It's helping, to me, be, helping me to be different. Because the, the person who went in is different than the person who came out. Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Yeah. Now, th thank you. Amen. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it, buddy. So here's, here's the last thing I want to say, and then um, we're going to receive the offering and we'll dismiss. Stop it. Just stop. Stop making excuses for yourself. Take ownership. Stop it. Take personal responsibility. Well, my dad was always, shh. Stop it. Don't even want to hear that. Well, my mom, I was, no, that doesn't work anymore. You're different. Now that, by the way, that's not pastor judging you. That's you judging you. And the Bible says that if you'll judge yourself, it'll be easier for you. So if you'll judge yourself, it will be better for you. Stop it. Everybody say, stop it. Stop it. If you've got to look at yourself in the mirror, I look at myself in the mirror you probably think I didn't today. That's why I dressed this way. But I did. I actually chose this. 
But if I look myself in the mirror and I say, don't do anything stupid today, you're going to have so many opportunities to screw it up. But you don't have to. You don't have to screw it up today. Plenty of opportunities will arise. Just do your best not to. And then if you do, then I'm done. If you do, don't, don't make some lame excuse like, that's the way I am. That's the way I was raised. That's how I've always done. Spank yourself and then change. Amen? Did you get anything out of that today? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you that we can honor you with the tithe. We thank you that we can give the offering that we've purposed in our heart to give or that you've led us to give. Father, I, pray, I, I know that's what you told me to share. I, I can't believe that people loved every bit of it, but I did obey you. So help us to follow it. Help us to live it. In fact, we all have to. It's, re, it's required of us to walk since we have now walk. Since we have, now walk. Since we have called on the Father, now walk in this newness of life. So we thank you, Father, that we can do it. We can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. I pray, Father, a blessing over every person in this room. Concerning their offering, I pray that their gift and the giver are both blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for promoting the work of the ministry here in Jesus' name. And everybody said...